Welcome back to another episode of The Debrief. I know it's been a while and we really we were really running out of time to get this episode out. Frankly, it is, of course, our awards for the 2022 season, which is now months, months away. Uh, but with just a couple weeks to go before the 2023 season, we figured we should acknowledge who we thought were the standout climbers from last year. And uh, getting the gang back together from last year's episode, you know him, you love him. It's John Bergman, of course, writing for Climbing Magazine, writing for Climbing Business Journal, and of course, course, the author of High Drama, The Rise, Fall, and Rebirth of Competition Climbing. Uh, and then uh, uh, our other two guests for our award show, of course, Natalie Berry, who writes for UK Climbing, uh, joining us from, uh, you're in Scotland right now or somewhere else? Scotland. Scotland. Yeah. Okay, cool. It's nighttime <laughs> over there. And then yeah. joining us from New Zealand, uh, comp watcher extraordinaire, former IFSC photographer and uh, and doing tons of work writing and photography for uh, the circuit climbing is, of course, Eddie Falk. Uh, everybody's, uh, uh, well, Eddie, you just got out of surgery in the last 12 hours, right? Yeah, so I just had uh, all the metal work taken out of my knee. So this bad boy, whole bunch of titanium screws, uh, which is awesome because I had the surgery to repair my knee last year but with the metal plate down the front of my knee I couldn't kneel and if you're a photographer working in front of a crowd you need to kneel so no more metal I can kneel I can start shooting from the knee again perfect Hopefully we'll see you back in action on the circuit sooner or later but uh, if you watched this episode last year you know we do four awards we cover the rookie of the year we cover the breakout athlete of the year and then we do our male climber and female climber of the season so we're going to start with the rookie and i'm going to throw to john first john and eddie i think you're of a similar mind on this one so john start us off who is the rookie uh, of the year for 2022 i'll start us off uh i give the award the rookie of the year award to team usa's sam watson 16 years old last season he uh, won gold medal in a in a speed World Cup, which I'll talk about in just a second. 16 years old, winning a speed gold medal. I believe, he, unless somebody does gets uh, beats him by uh, whatever a, a, a couple days or a couple months, that will probably stay forever because I don't know if people know, but the IFSC voted to raise the and Tyler, you can chime in here as well because you know the details of this. But they voted to raise the minimum age for participation in World Cups to 17, starting in 2025. So we have the 2024 season where if another 16-year-old who happens to be just days or whatever younger than Sam Watson was, maybe they'll they'll beat him. But my money would be on Sam forever being the youngest competitor to ever win a speed gold medal. But yeah, so Sam Watson, let's go back in time to the 2022 season. He wins in... Edinburgh, Edinburgh. Uh, if people remember the final round of that World Cup, I think there were like five Americans that made it into the final speed round. And so when that was happening, I was thinking, OK, if one of these Americans does end up doing considerably better than the others here, maybe even making a podium or if an American ends up winning, I think they're going to kind of be seen as the de facto leader or new leader of this squad of Americans that are capable of making the final round. And it ended up being the youngest of them all, Sam Watson. And it was an exciting final round, too. He beat Jinbao Long, so it's it's not like he beat some scrub in the big final race or anything like that. And part of the reason, though, why I want to give this award to him, there's kind of two reasons. First of all, it didn't completely dictate my choice, but I kind of felt compelled to give this to a speed climber if if possible, because I think this season, 2023, heading into the Olympics, I think speed and the speed climbers are going to get a lot of focus and a lot of press because speed is, as we all know, the easiest discipline for the layperson viewer to understand, blah, blah, blah. And speed is now separate from the lead and boulder combined. So I think we'll see a lot of these people that did shine on the speed circuit last season 2022 getting a lot of press and promotion this this year at heading into the olympics so like i said it didn't completely dictate my whole choice but i just it felt good to give this to a to a rookie additionally i don't know if other people in in other countries realize this but there was some buzz for sam prior to this 
rookie season that he had, 2022. He had, he he was a decorated youth competitor. He had this nickname Sub Six Sam because he was the first one of his age, youth age, to to go sub six on a speed run. So he had this domestic buzz. And as we know, anytime somebody has that domestic buzz and they enter the adult circuit. For better or worse, there's just two ways it, it gets interpreted. Either it's it's a, a a boom or a bust, right? Either they it seems like they had a phenomenal first season, or it's like, oh man, they didn't live up to all the hype and whatever. That's a whole different discussion. Suffice to say, I think Sam lived up to it. Most excitingly, last season, 2022, he was running consistently 5.4 ish. I don't know what his PR is, but if he can run 5-4 consistently, that's really close to the American record, which is 5-2. So we'll see what happens this 2023 season. Yeah, I, I think the I think you're right about the uniqueness of how young he was. Eddie, I don't know, like you've of course you've seen and, and followed a lot of speed climbers and had to shoot a lot of them. Um like the the fact that he I think he was technically was he 15 at the time that he won this, but still remarkable that it is like your legit first eligible season and you're managing to get that speed win like Eddie somebody that's followed a lot you know we, you've never seen that before I know in modern speed he is for sure the youngest it's possible but I, I really don't think it's likely that somebody was younger than him but yeah just talk talk on that point Eddie for a moment yeah so from my recollection I can't think of a younger speed climber coming through in the men's division in the women's we've had some come onto the scene strong young but seldom to the very top step. And speed has always been a discipline which rewards experience. If you generally look at a speed final, the athletes are mid-20s quite often, all the way into mid-30s, especially with the men. You've got people like the Marworms, like Daniel Boldarev. Uh, you know, sadly, the Russians, because of political circumstances, can't be with us, but a lot of them are older as well. And it's always been understood that speed is something that takes time to refine, to truly bed in and get that mindset, get the routine, the beta perfect. And so to come in, you know, turning 16 last year and win a World Cup and be consistent most of the season, like to me, that was a huge standout because of all the disciplines as i said speed tends to be the one where experience reigns and you're looking at athletes a decade older than yeah absolutely natalie tell me about your uh who you thought might uh, might be eligible for rookie of the year this season yeah my pick predictably is toby roberts <laughs> um yeah he of, of course if you don't really know the name he won uh, he came third in the edinburgh round of the lead world cup and he's been a bit of a domestic star in the UK he's just he's only 18 but he's won like all the junior titles that you can win in senior stuff as well he came first in the European Cup um there weren't many big names there but at the same time he was still one of the youngest and managed a convincing win um and then he won last year two silvers in the world youth championships as well I know we don't always necessarily count success at youth level um but it kind of his trajectory last year was just getting like better and better uh, winning more and more medals and then he yeah home world cup in Ratho, edinburgh i was actually there watching it in person and it made the final and in a final was like the likes of jakob schuber luca potichar jesse grouper um the, the final route was really awkward and he came out quite early and like set a really good high point of like 30 odd plus holds. And he should have been knocked out of the podium places like five times that comp. Yeah. yeah the yeah. route was really odd. Like it was kind of like an outdoor route, just really awkward compression moves, a dyno halfway that kind of saw the likes of Jakob Schubert off. And he was just really impressive, you know, especially on home tough just to, you know, maybe that buoyed him and maybe that helped him up the wall, but he just didn't seem phased and just went for it and ended up third. Um, and that was actually the first time in 28 years that a British male athlete, obviously Molly Thompson-Smith came third in 2017, I think. Um, but yeah, the first time in 28 
years that a British male athlete had made a World Cup lead podium. And I, I think that's quite special because in Britain, we've got this really strong heritage of bouldering, but not so much in lead, especially in the men's field. Um, we've always had like Will Bosey making finals a lot of the time, but and we've never had like a male medal in, in recent years, like for nearly 30 years. So sure, yeah. I think for Toby to do that on home ground on the weekend that the, the Queen <laughs> the queen was in Edinburgh after she died, like it was a really historic weekend, but quite interesting for the rest of the field to be in the UK was- at that I was going to say when I saw your nomination, I was going to call you out for, for just like, just like John always does, like in my opinion, just like blatant patriotic, like choices, yeah. <laughs> like, but, and so the one thing I was, I'm sure that must've been a very unusual weekend for everybody at the Edinburgh, <laughs> and like just trying to yeah. cope with just the, the entire, like, you know, yeah. um, just national psyche must've been so mm-hmm. shaken and, and unusual for everybody. Yeah. And then of course, uh, Toby's excellent climb. Mm-hmm. But when I, you know, when I was looking for, for my rookie of the season, this season was much harder than last year you know last year we had Kiramel Kadabin we had Oriane Berton all these people like getting medals breaking records like really really strong candidates for for rookie of the year whereas this year one of the other people I was considering was Gilou uh, Lo, who earned the bronze as well um, but in bouldering at Brixen and that was one of the few kind of like standout individual performances of the year kind of just like Toby um, my my rookie of the year though is is uh, um, uh, similar similar to uh to the boys who picked uh uh sam watson is uh and i'm gonna mess up the pronunciation for sure but jingo long who while three years older than sam this was his first year of of speed world cups as well right so his first uh his first rookie year in his case um and the the circumstances are are somewhat similar now like we all know the chinese climbers only showed up for the second half of the speed season so he only competed in about half as many events as sam watson and i i think just the interesting you know debate on this one between sam and jingo is is that uh uh jingo won his gold in his first ever world cup his very first world cup he shows up to he wins the thing and it was a very impressive uh win putting up fast times in every round that he needed to it generally like very clean wins as well um not not you know getting the luck of the draw against false starts and falls for the most part and in his debut event walks away with the gold for sam it took him i don't know if it was his fifth or his sixth it was towards the end of the season that uh sam won his but for both of these climbers you know even though jingo only had four events and sam had six or seven they were both consistently in the finals i think right like sam may have had one event where he didn't make it to the final round but so while while sam is you know probably the youngest ever speed climber to earn a gold medal jingo got his in his debut event kind of you know like a like an alex johnson style thing or uh uh so another unique just little superlative moment in speed climbing and it's uh it's kind of funny how this year it was kind of the speed climbers that had the most convincing uh argument for rookie of the year um but yeah so that's where that's where i landed and my thing was just um you know I think partially because we were so isolated from the Chinese team, it was kind of a surprise to see all these guys show up in one event. And this kid just absolutely killed it at like 18 or 19 years old. Whereas Sam, he'd had a bunch of World Cups kind of ramping up to this. He had a little bit of time to get warmed up. He had done those Youth World Championships recently, whereas Jingguo didn't have as much of that experience, especially in the couple of years leading up to it. So to me, that kind of stood out as a, as a more impressive achievement. So, so my vote for, uh, uh, for Rookie of the Year goes to him. I think that's a um, really important thing you brought up, though, there was also the return of people we hadn't seen because of COVID restrictions. And for them to come out of the gates like that, as you said, after three years being off the map, and obviously, uh, I think it's uh, Xing Song, the old legend uh, Chinese speed climber, has been running a training center and getting this next generation up to speed. And you could just see when they came out, but also the lead climbers, you know, they had some a fantastic re-emergence as well. There was a few blips, but for three years out of international setting, out of international coaching, out of the international circuit, the circuit, I thought that was pretty impressive. 
Yeah, I, I think this year is going to be the, the most exciting part, right? Is because we, we kind of got a taste of Indonesia in 2021 and, and a little bit before that. And 2022 is a chance for them to like let loose, right? And with China, 2022 is their chance to kind of show up and give us a give us a little glimpse. And hopefully this year we just see a yeah, complete brawl. I would I would love to see those those climbers be going head to head at every comp if we get the chance. So very excited for the speed season. Yeah. Um, let's talk about the next category, which is breakout of the year. This one's a little more abstract. Breakout can kind of mean whatever you want it to mean, although we try to root it in athletic achievement and kind of who took the next step or who who kind of like reached the next level in recognition. Um, I'm, I'll, I'm just going to start this one off. And I think, John, you and I overlap on this one. And for me, the breakout is got to be Aimori. Um, and I'm kind of using the... Um, the YouTube grubby like replay channels that just kind of like copy IFSC content and then spit it back out with a new thumbnail. Basically after those two events, Coper in Edinburgh, where she, you know, made a new name for herself, suddenly all those YouTubers were no longer releasing like clips of Yanya. It was all about Aimori. Um, again, she only competed in three World Cups this entire season. Those two lead World Cups in uh, Coper in Edinburgh, and then the unusual Boulder and Lead uh, combined World Cup in Morioka. She won all three of them, and she won in ways that, you know, especially for those lead events, it felt like she was very much on par with Yanya, uh, whereas Yanya didn't attend the Morioka one, and, and I was convincingly in the lead pretty much the entire uh, event. Um, but I think it was the first time that we got to see somebody uh, in the last couple of years that actually just by the eye test, and when I say I, I mean like EYE test, not AI test. I looked to the standard of Yanya. It looked like those were, um, you know, they were peers in terms of their strength and, and their ability. And even though we've had these other names come up, like uh, uh, like Natalia, we may talk about like even Hannah Moyle later on. I think I made a convincing argument that that I am ready to be the future right now. It's not like I need some more development and I may start winning events more often. It was like, I'm, I'm here now and ready to go. Um, that's kind of my argument for that. Uh, John, I don't know if you have anything to add on. I feel like some people might suggest that she's not a breakout because 2019 was a good year for her, but hopefully they just keep quiet about it and, and we can win on a technicality. But yeah, John, what about you? Yeah, I don't know if I have a whole lot additional stuff to add, but just to kind of hop on top of all of that, I just think about the think about the term, the breakout, right? And and just think about the I don't know, like the figurative shell that Yanya has over this women's field and has had for several seasons now, dating back to 2019 when she swept the boulder, if not, you know, maybe a season or a couple seasons before that. So this the women's division has really been synonymous with Yanya for for years now. And then for I, Mori to come out and just totally disrupt the whole field the, and the whole narrative. I mean, think about what how it played out. So Yanya comes for the first bouldering World Cup of the season in Meiringen. She wins it. So we think, OK, this is going to be Yanya. Just another Dominated. year, you know? Yeah. Just another year, right? And I, w I, I'm sure we'll talk about this more when we get to our other awards. But then, as everybody knows, Yanya stepped away. Then Natalia starts dominating the Boulder circuit. And we say, okay, well, Yanya's gone. Now it's going to be Natalia's season. And then Yanya comes back for the lead and starts dominating. And we think, okay, Yanya's back. Now here's the story. Yanya's going to dominate. And then right when we think we have this whole story figured out, Imori comes in. As you said, wins in Coper, wins in Edinburgh. And it wasn't like these are really narrow victories. She beats Yanya by three points in Coper. And in Edinburgh, I think she, I, Mori, and Yanya both topped. But if you count back to the semifinal round, I was two points higher than Yanya. So pretty decisive victories. And like you said, Tyler, you come away from this season as I, Mori, thinking I, Mori was one of the big, the biggest names of the whole year, even though she really didn't do that many 
comps at all. I don't sure. remember if this is, I, but I have in my head, I don't think she even earned enough points to make the top 10 of the lead World Cup, right? Like she won yeah. two events dominantly, but just the cumulative like points of all the other people that stayed in the finals or the upper semis was enough for her to like barely make a mark on the lead ranking. So, you know, it, it was really just, uh, it's, it's kind of crazy to see how few events she had to have to just like, you know, just completely shatter what the attitude of, of the audience was. It was nuts. Yeah, and shout out to all the people that I'm sure will chime in and say, oh, I'm Ori, like you said, Tyler. It's not a breakout. This wasn't a breakout year. She broke out in previous years. Yes, she did get a bronze in in lead at, uh, I think it was 2019. I think the World Championships there, she also earned a bronze medal. Okay, so she had some success before, but that is not the same as beating Yanya, beating Yanya decisively, beating Yanya decisively multiple times, and and... Also beating, we should say, Cheyun in the process, Brooke Rabatou in the process, all these other people. That's why I have to I have to say this was her breakout year more so than 2019 and whatnot. I would argue slightly with decisively on the sort of by two holds thing. But she is beating not just Yanya, but the whole field, as you said. That's the thing. It's not that Yanya's having a bad day, it's that she's climbing better than the best. And yes, you can look back at 2019 and say, well, we knew she was the coming thing. But a lot happens between 2019 and 2022. And, you know, she had to maintain that. And I think it's very interesting how much in some ways her progression mirrors Yanya's and that the Japanese have been very careful with her to put her in, take her out, put her in, take her out, not burn her out. And you saw very much the same with Yanya's early career where she would only get entered in a few World Cups because they didn't want to just throw her into the maelstrom straight away. And I think part of that with I is education and things like that that she's still completing. But that, I think, is a really clever way of ensuring the longevity of your athletes. And the Japanese have played, I think, a blinder of eye. I think the next few years is going to be super rivalries in the women's divisions. The Japanese are too good with longevity. That's their problem is you've got all these upstart kids coming in, but then they've still got these ancient guys like hogging all the all the spots, especially, you know, with only, you know, two spots per country for the Olympics. You got you, feel, you got to feel sorry for like a lot of, especially on the male side, right? All those upcoming strong boys that are, are absolutely killing it, but guess what? Yoshiyuki's still here. Kokoro's still here. Tomo is still here. Like, good luck, guys. It's uh, their longevity is too good. It's nuts. Um, yeah, Eddie, Natalie, I'm curious uh, if uh, if you guys feel the same way, or if you had other uh, other contenders for this that you wanted to mention, or just like honorable mentions. Yeah, definitely. Watching I, it was like watching a totally different climber this year, which was a really good thing because I think previously. You know, we've had concerns about female athletes not having enough power, you know, maybe classing them as more as endurance climbers rather than power climbers. But it definitely seemed to me that whatever she was doing up until those two competitions that she won, she was really focusing on getting stronger, becoming a more powerful climber, getting better at dynamic moves. And yeah, she just seems like a much more well-rounded athlete. And I think if she's focusing on the olympics i assume she would be you know i'm interested to to see you know maybe she's been training bouldering a lot more than lead and the two have just kind of meshed together quite well but yeah really impressive to watch she was just you know superior to yanya um anyway unfortunately in edinburgh i think the route setting did let both women down a little bit but you know i think for i to still keep ahead together and top out that route and win three major competitions at the end of the season it's not a one-off it's yeah true form i think yeah absolutely um yeah I, you know I, I think back to 2019 and the theme that kind of came up was this kid looks remarkably strong and very talented but sometimes you'd question like the decision making sometimes you you like natalie you said like with dynamic movement sometimes almost almost just not moving with enough confidence on particular moves like some of those events where she did really well i'm thinking whatever that boulder event was that i think she meddled in um she's getting all the tops that everybody else is getting for the most part but it's just taking way more attempts and it's just like you know these these movements where you're already like kid you're already there you just you're not 
committing to this mm. properly or you're just like a little bit too unsure about how you're placing yourself. Whereas this season, just like incredible confidence, making excellent decisions mm. and and making good decisions where you would see people like in especially in the Coper final in particular. I made that move look easy and, and Yanya, you know, fluffed it. And uh, again, it kind of, it is kind of a, a situation where there's only a couple particular examples where you say, okay, this was a definitive moment where she performed better than Yanya. And there's quite a lot of like other circumstance involved in, uh, in the other rounds of those two wins. But the fact that you're like up there, the fact that it's so close that it comes down to circumstance says everything um with uh with eyes here so yeah i think i think it's entirely different than 2019 especially because 2019 like we just had this glut of young incredible asian climbers if you had to pick your breakout in 2019 it would have been shy and so entirely and i mori would be like two three four steps down so i think i think that was for sure, I'm Maury's first appearance in 2019, but this was the year where she she made Matured. a huge step up. Yeah. Exactly, 100%. Are there any other names that people want to mention in this? Because this was actually one of the harder categories for me in that the list was very long, even though I thought I'm Maury was clearly at the top. There was a lot of other names, especially in the lead like men's category. There's so many other people you can mention, but I don't know if anybody wants to bother giving a round of honorable mentions at all. <laughs> uh, Natalie, do you want to run first? I... I don't want to pick another Brit, but I'm going to because we're doing well. <laughs> <laughs> so we're, think, we're ganging up on John. Yeah, I think everyone knows who Max Millen is by now. Like he kind of broke out in 2021 when he made finals in Salt Lake, but he came sixth. Um, he kind of, you know, people started paying attention to him. But then this year, he was quite consistent at the start. He was like making fun making top 10, like eighth in Meringen, eighth in Seoul, and then second in Brixen, but almost won. Like he was a bonus uh, zone. Yeah, what is it called? Zone, I'm forgetting zone, how wrong yeah, it yeah. was. <laughs> bonus zone. Um, yeah, he was one zone away from winning and just really made his mark. And I think people kind of fell for his personality and charisma and like just his self-confidence on the mats as much as for his talent because yeah he's so good at this new school movement and since then it was a shame he couldn't you know rack up another medal or go one step further but I think after that he started to concentrate a bit more on lead ahead of Paris or ahead of qualification this year so I think that accounts for why the first half of the season was quite successful and he seemed to be on an upwards tra trajectory and then kind of dipped down a bit but I think he was just working towards lead but for that me for me I think you know, that that proved that he had the potential to win Boulder World Cups and I'm, I'm really excited to see what he does this season yeah Eddie you got any names you want to toss in there Oh, absolutely. But I'm just going to back up on the Max Milne thing and say, you know, his flamboyance and his personality, which is something you really see in the strong boulderers more than anyone else, I feel, is excellent because it's like it just makes it so much fun to watch when you get this generation of guys like Max, Hamish, Mejdi Schalk um, coming through and they've got quite flamboyant personalities you can actually feel the the joy the despair the and everything in between when you're watching whereas some of the um more stoic climbers in the past would show very little emotion and as a photographer i know that having that like excited photographer that excited um athlete is such a big thing like because it the crowd resonate with it the crowd love it it's just great for the sport but my pick for breakout and this was incredibly challenging because again you know the young japanese coming through in lead um people coming up in speed people coming up everywhere um has anyone else got a funny sound going on i think somebody might just be typing yeah i think there's just keyboard okay. noise it's all good okay um so it sounded like a horse clomping behind the back <laughs> Okay. I was like look at, looking for the Clydesdale in the back of someone's screen. Um, my pick for breakout is actually the complete opposite side of breakout, and it's when an older established athlete finds their feet. So my breakout for the year is Jesse Grouper because he, in 2015 at Youth Worlds, 
uh, came second, lost on account back after topping the final route to um, Bernard Roark, uh, Magdalena Roark's brother. Um, and he beat, you know, all the strong young Japanese kids that were expected to beat him and stuff back then. And then he went and had an education. And then he had health issues and he's been on a roller coaster. And every time he's come to World Cups, he's shown the potential, but it's never been enough of him for him to realize that potential. And then, um, yeah, when he came out this year, and I think off the top of my head when I click this, you know, he went, um, what did he go? He went third, second. Then he went 35th because he grabbed the side of a wall and thinking it was on and screwed himself in Chamonix. But then he went uh, fourth at World Games, first in Briançon, had another shocker in Copa, and then first in Edinburgh. And, like, for someone who's now 26, for that to be their first real sort of breakthrough is, to me, much more of a breakthrough. And it's, you know, the tragedy for me is he has this amazing breakthrough year in the year that the IFSC cut podium prize money massively. So he ends up struggling to make ends meet rather than reaping the rewards. You know, he earns thousands of dollars less than he would have if he had had the success in 2021 or even back, probably even back in 2015, he would have made more than he won this year, oh, last year now. Um, so that sort of can I can I double check? Is that like is that um I, I'm trying to remember because I know there was a redistribution and I'm not I'm not like spouting IFSC stuff. We just I remember we were talking about this. Is this where they they kind of push the distribution of the money further down the top eight or ten? Uh, absolutely. So, so technic- the technically they give out a, about the same money, but there's less for but the top goes, guys, right? It goes yeah. deeper. So if you're on the yeah. podium, so for instance, I think first place off the top of my head is about twelve hundred euros less. Um, than it was. I, I'll which, be honest, I don't remember, so I'm, I'm going to take your word yeah. for it, but yeah. But the thing is, so the actual prize money pool increased, um, although it didn't increase to match inflation, but then none of us expected inflation to be what it was last year. So, that, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, so the actual prize money pool increased, but the depth of the prize money also increased, which meant for the guys that did well, their takings actually decreased, which is a shame. And, you know, one thing I'd love to see this year, now that we've got all this big discovery money, is we should be paying down to 20th place. We should be paying everyone that's on TV and semis, even if it's just their entry fee back, all the way up to, say, $10,000 for the winner. You know, the IFSC, if it's making this money, let's Mm. put it back into the athletes. I mean, and I know this is just diverting slightly, but in the USA, a bunch of the athletes are getting on the plane to fly back to Europe and the IFSC guys getting on and sitting in business class, you know, rather than putting money into business class flights for IFSC, let's put money into the athletes. Fair enough. Yeah. Um, and just last point on Jesse, uh, cause he, uh, like, I mean, this is kind of minor. He was the only guy to win two lead world cups this season. So that's cool by itself. But if you look at the distribution of the ranking points and those top three guys at the end of the year as what Luca, Luca first, Tysay yeah. second, Jesse third, if I remember that right, it was so close. And if he hadn't grabbed the, the freaking wall and had come, cause that what, what screwed Jesse this year is he had two, two really bad placings and you can always drop your. You drop your worst, but he got punished by having that second one. And so if he had just on that climb where he touched the wall, if he had just climbed to a regular height, he absolutely would have won the season. And uh, and so he's he deserves to get a little bit more recognition than he does because uh, he climbed. He climbed like a like a World Cup winner, honestly. Yeah, I mean, the maturity in his game compared to where it was a few years ago, because he always had the potential I remember years ago, you know, I know Jesse reasonably well, and I'd pick him up from the airport when he'd come into Europe and take him to Briançon and stuff. But that was back before Team USA was really unified and working together and laying the platform for their athletes. And so he was always a bit playing catch up. And now Team USA is so well organized, so well structured. It really helps these guys with the opportunities to, when they're there, they're in the right position to perform. For sure. Let's uh let's stay on the on the 
on the track of just talking about strong male climbers and talk about our uh, our men of the year, our male climbers of the year. Um, with this one, I don't really know where to start. I'm thinking maybe, uh, Natalie, do you want to lead this one off? Because I kind of kind of in mm-hmm. a similar vein of what we're talking about right now. Yeah, I chose Luca Potichar, obviously overall World Cup winner and lead last year. Um, I think it was just having watched him in Edinburgh and then winning on his home turf in Copa, like a new World Cup. There was a load of excitement about it. All the Slovenians were really excited. Um, I think the fact that Janja... Did we maybe all expected at least one Slovenian to win, and we expected that to be Janja, but don't think we would have necessarily chosen Luca. Um, but yeah, I get he was just very consistent at the start of the year, top ten to top fifteen placings, and then second at the European Championships in Munich, and then wins in Copa, and then like constant final consistent finalist after that. And then thoroughly deserved the overall win. I think I know Jesse was super close. Um, so yeah, it would be hard for me to choose between them. But I think purely because because of that win at a new World Cup in Slovenia and just consistency, really impressive. That that win at home was awesome. That that Copa yeah. win was was a highlight for sure. Also, I think it kind of cursed Yanya. You're not allowed to have mm. you're not allowed to have both winners come from two uh, winners. Come from yeah, that would have been a dream. <laughs> Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, it was uh, the one thing I'll point out about Luca is I, I guess I just, um, I, I haven't thought too hard about Slovenian male lead climbers mm-hmm. in a bit. And it yeah. feels kind of cool that that's balancing out a little bit more to match the fact that, you know, Slovenian women have been talented and excellent in both disciplines. And it's kind of nice to see uh, one of the boys show up in lead climbing and look like, you know, considering how young he is, look like he's might have some staying power. So I'm, I'm very excited for that. Um, and uh, might give Slovenia a more balanced um, field, possibly going into Olympic qualification. I think that could be really cool. So, yeah. Um, Eddie, what about you, man? What uh, what would you place as your top guy? Uh, well, for me, it comes down to consistency and consistency in the hardest field to be consistent in. Because to me, nothing is harder to be consistent in than men's bouldering. You could be winning one week and missing semis the next, and no one even acts surprised anymore. That's how tight the field is, and with the setting and the variables, it's incredibly hard to be a consistent boulderer. So my pick here is definitely Yoshiyuki Ogata. Um, He won the season. He tied the season in 2021 with Kokoro Fuji. This year, he took it going away. He was looked great almost always in fact i think always on the podium ah sorry with the exception of brixton and to you know that level of consistency against this field is just you know people don't realize how much one bolt of it you can't figure out or you can't unlock can be a season changer when things are that tight and so, you know, I've watched Yoshiyuki's progress for half a decade now. And again, he's very unlike a lot of the other Japanese climbers in that he's quite flamboyant and extroverted. And he's, you know, he, he's the one that's going to have the funny quotes on the IFSC website or say great things in interviews. He's got the personality, which I think is fantastic. And that's nothing against the quiet personalities, but to an in, to an international audience, having that that energy is really... I remember in 2019, we had a competition in Israel and Yoshiyuki was one of the invited climbers. And all the kids were lining up, and he's running up and down lines of kids, high- high-fiving everyone. like, And it was proper rock star moment. And then he backed it up. You know, he came out of the COVID lockdown, as I said, tied with Kokoro in 21, and then just amazing, amazing last year. Like, I was, yeah, I was absolutely chuffed for him. 
he he wins for the male medal count for sure like he got like five medals in bouldering and then second in the combined event so yeah i i this is the toughest category for me i think in terms of just like comparing comparing climbers but you mentioned interesting like he travels really well he goes to a lot of these smaller like regional comps not just in asia but in europe and north america and he he gets around and puts a good face um on for for being like a star climber and i think yeah let's let's hope he doesn't get married anytime soon because that seems to be what uh, <laughs> uh I, I i i think he's having a bit too much fun for that to happen oh, okay. right now but um but yeah you see him at the cliff and then you'll see him in israel and then you'll see him in japan and then he's back in europe and he's really doing the professional climber thing just yeah. fantastic as yeah, he's making fans, yeah. right? You know, he's going out and yeah. meeting the people where they're at. And yeah, it's it's awesome. Which is part of being a professional athlete. It's all very good to be locked down and very good at your craft. But if you want to be marketable, you need that energy about you. And he's got that energy about him. He's got good English as well, which I think really helps. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. It's interesting that we talk about all this stuff that these great qualities that he has because that is something that uh, unfortunately I don't see in a lot of the other up and coming uh, women on team Japan. Now we've seen, I think Akio was charismatic and she, and she kind of had that, that special something about her. And I think Miho Nanaka has that. I'm not so sure. I don't want to like sit here and like name names of people that I don't think have it, but I'm just saying, well, I mean, that, like, I, I, Mori, I, well, I if way. I Mori is the female face of Japanese climbing now, then that is a, 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 an incredibly stark comparison, you know, like it's a, a stone faced and, and, you know, just the, it's a completely different way of expressing yourself at the moment, especially with, with like foreign language media, at least it's mm-hmm. much more reserved. Oh, for, for me, I Mori actually very much reminds me of Dmitry Sharafudinov back in about 2012, just True. the, the assassin eyes, the stone face killer. Yeah. You know, I remember Udo or Killian or someone saying at the time that if someone said, Oh yeah, um, Dimitri's a KGB agent. No one would be surprised. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> and you kind of get that same vibe of eye. She's she's very much wears a mask. Um, Natsuki definitely shows a bit more personality, but of course they're still very young. Mm-hmm. But the one that I would say is the exception to what John's saying, and I very much agree with what John's saying, but the exception is Futaba Ito. She's mm-hmm. she's a star. She's really got that sort of again slightly gregacious outgoing personality a little bit less formal a little more western and, and this will come so obviously i've traveled with these guys for many many years and the formality of some of the older japanese athletes you 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 might meet someone like akio and you, you'll give a polite bow to each other because that's deserving of her status damn respect yeah (laughs) yeah but whereas Futaba will come up and give you a hug Hmm. and that's the that's the the 10 15 year age gap with Hmm. the more westernization of the culture you know same with some of the guys they were you know friendly but very traditional and reserved and then you get a few that come through and break that mold and i you know, it's it's actually the best thing for Japan climbing mm-hmm. um, is that they then become globally marketable because they're not just another person in a blue shirt. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know if this is polite for me to say, but John, when we were in Salt Lake, the 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 Japanese boys in the crowd were one of the most obnoxious teams when it came to cheering on their teammates in the in the finals it was like geez these guys really are just screaming the entire time um but uh yeah so it seems like the the younger they get the the more they're loosening up for uh for yeah. sure yeah um john tell me tell me about your man of the year because i think you i think you were the guy that was like flip-flopping the most so i'm kind of curious where you fell yeah i thought this one was really hard to pick a definitive choice i ended up going with kiro mal kiro mal Kativin, as my male climber of the year and i'll back up a little bit because eddie said that he consistency is what he leans on when choosing this and i would be very curious to hear what everybody's metrics were or rubrics were this is what drives us crazy when people start talking about 
so and so being the greatest of all time. We we're always like, okay, well, what is your what is your metric for this? Like, how are you, what are you using to inform that choice? And so, I agree with Eddie uh, uh, about the consistency thing. I went a little bit deeper. I I broke it down into three subcategories that informed this decision. My my selection for Kira Mao. consistency certainly adversity. Meaning at some point during the season, I wanted to see this person pushed to the limit or push the limit and then come out successful. It's a little bit subjective, but I think it will be self-evident when we start talking about Kira Miles' results. And then the third point, I just labeled it like transcendence or something, right? I want them to sort of, the special something that elevates them beyond just the results. So that was it. Consistency, adversity, and transcendence. So let's go through them here, why I chose Kira Mal for all these. Consistency, not great. I think some of that is the nature of speed climbing. There's so much risk reward and and some of the speed climbers went to certain World Cups and didn't go to others, as we've said. So Kira Mal ends up getting a gold medal in Salt Lake City. And then he gets two silver medals. He gets one in Seoul and one in Jakarta, which is his home country. So I think that counts for something. But I think more important than maybe the medal count for a speed climber and Kiramal in this case, the consistency of at the beginning of the season, 2022, he held the world record in the men's speed run. And at the end of 2022, he held the male, the men's speed record world record. So he was, he consistently held that record throughout the whole season. Adversity. This is where maybe you could, you could knock Kiramau a little bit. He did have that one big final in Seoul where it was strange. He was up against his teammate, Vedrick Leonardo, and they both, I think they both false started and then they, ran it again and Kiramal false started again. So Vedrit got the victory, but I think adversity is just kind of built into speed because it's so much, you, you just stumble just a little bit or false start and you're, you're out, you're dashed right there. So I think the adversity aspect kind of speaks for itself. And then the transcendence, this is where Kiramal really shines because He breaks the world record, his own world record, basically five times throughout the season. And a world record is something that transcends any sport. You can go to anybody, even if they don't follow competition climbing, you can say, hey, this person is a world record breaker, world record holder. That will mean something to the lay person. That will mean something. Somebody will understand what that means, at least in broad concept, even if they know nothing about competition climbing. I looked up briefly, not even Usain Bolt broke his own his own world record in all in in a bunch of the different races five times. So that is something that I think we might never, ever see in this sport again. We might never see somebody break the world record five times in a single season. Beyond that, I'll close by saying. The when OK, the world record before Kira Mal started doing all of this was Reza's at 5.4 that was in 2017 and Kira Mal gets into 5.2 in 2021 so 2017 18 19 20 21 four or five seasons depending on how you want to look at it it take it took him four or five seasons to break to go down 0.2 in the speed time and he went down that much just in the 2022 season alone starting with 5.2 at the beginning of the season at the end of the season Kira Mal's running five flat so he basically did five years worth of chipping away to world record in a single season. I just I would have a hard time seeing how anybody could argue somebody else is more worthy of male of the year. I so I ended up following with Kira Mel as well. I'm just gonna follow up real quick and then Eddie Eddie might have some opinions. And and I, I the the hard part for this is I I think Yoshiki had is either one A or one B. That's that's my problem, and I'm trying to measure two entirely different things. Kira Malkatabin is not very good at winning speed medals for somebody that can go this fast, and that's the that's kind of the the weak part of his climbing. But I for for me personally in speed, I have certainly kind of come to realize that I at least do value the people that push the times further. Um, and Kiramel, like, I mean, Kiramel still making finals at, at pretty much every event, right? It's not like he's shitting the bed and not putting up a good time in qualifiers. He's always there in finals, but, but he false starts, he falls, he makes mistakes. 
but like John said, this guy is doing something that I don't think anybody has ever done. And the data is very incomplete. The IFSC themselves have not published full data on like comprehensive speed record history, but nobody else has broken the speed record five times in a season. Like that has never happened. Almost always when people break speed records, it is an exceptional performance, not just for the field, but like for themselves, right? Like Reza never matched his time again, right? He put up that time and him and the entire field couldn't do it again, right? That was that, was that like you, you caught lightning in a bottle and that defined the ultimate speed time for four or five seasons. Whereas Kiramel, he is consistently pushing the boundaries, like he's he's at the like tip of the you know jet plane, just banging through the speed of sound, and he just keeps breaking it over and over and over and over and over again. Like this is his normal level, is just the the sharpest tip of the spear. And I can't think of anybody else that has done that so often and within such a short amount of time. Like that's just crazy. So I think Yoshiyuki's consistency and talent in bouldering was remarkable this year. He's obviously been huge for the last couple seasons but I don't know if we're ever going to see anybody do what Kiramal has done this last season I don't think we're ever going to see that ever again like surely somebody else comes along and breaks that record right like in 2021 Kiramal and Leonardo went back and forth a little bit and technically at the end of the year I think it was uh, Vedrik that held the, uh, um, the the speed record at the end of the season but this year was entirely Kiramal and even though he could only win a single speed event he defined the sport for the entire season and i just think like in in my personal like hierarchy of values that's a one-off that i don't think we'll see uh, for a very long time but uh but again yeah trying to measure the accomplishments in speed versus accomplishments in lead is brutal i don't know how to do it this is just kind of where i fall i don't know eddie if you wanted to to uh, follow up I'll let Nat- natalie Nat- natalie if you got anything i definitely do but i'll let natalie go yes not really i think you explained it really well like i think yeah it's really hard to compare all the disciplines but speed having that like world record it's always going to be you're going to compare people against you know not just on results but also how literally groundbreaking they are and i think yeah i think it would be really rare to see something like that again so yeah so i'm going to come out on the other side and say i completely and utterly disagree because I think Kiramel is a very good speed climber, but speed climbing is about racing. And three out of the four big finals he made this year, he screwed. And so he ended up second three times, first once. And it's all well and good to be fast on paper, but you got to put your money where your mouth is. And he hasn't shown that. If you compare that to Martin Tijanski of Poland in 2016, and it's the reason that the other speed climbers call him Mr. Perfect is because he won four Speed World Cups in a row and then Speed World Championships. That means he did not lose a race in a knockout round for five events. And that, to me, is way more admirable than going fast when the pressure's off and then screwing up when the pressure's on. And although I think I think Kiramel, you know, he's only 22. The sky's the limit. And I'm sure he's going to be a force to reckon with, but I don't think this year was the year that you could put him up there. If he had won three out of the four, I think there's an argument. If he won two out of the four, maybe one out of four finals, and a lot of the time silly mistakes costing him, just shows that he's not a mature racer yet. He's just a very, very, very fast speed climber. I, I don't I, disagree. Like, I think he is like comparatively bad at reaching the end of the speed route, which is, is like, a pretty damning <laughs> argument. But uh, I think, and you know, it's kind of unfair because with bouldering, um, it's, it's you now the getting a fast time and finishing the race are both elements, right, of competitive speed climbing. Whereas bouldering, to try and draw a comparison of like being very good at climbing hard stuff, but not performing in a comp, is kind of if we were to say like, hey, Sean Rabatou is one of the strongest, like is climbing the hardest grades in bouldering in the world, but he just doesn't do comps. And when he does it, like it never went as well as like it did for his sister kind of thing, right? So I feel like that's the closest I can get to a comparison of Sean is a very good boulderer. He's good at climbing hard boulders, but he's not a good competitor necessarily, right? And 
Kiramal just has the advantage where he has both of those elements within the competitive discipline, right? He's not good at winning the races, but he sends up monster times. Um, and so I think it is it is like an imbalanced argument. I don't really know how to how to reconcile that. And like I said, this one was a the hardest category for me to figure out. Um, but I, I have leaned towards people that can climb that route really freaking fast in the past. And so for now, at least to be consistent until until, you know, something changes my mind. I think, I think that's where I personally have to fall is with Kiramel, but it's a, it's an edge case for sure. I just don't know. And I, I take objection maybe to when you say Eddie, that the name of the game is speed climbing or, or it's all about the races in speed climbing. I, I certainly understand where you're coming from there, but I think if you would ask, if you would survey the speed climbers on the circuit and you say, would you rather win a world cup gold medal or would you rather hold a world record? My guess is that a vast majority of them would say they'd rather have the world record. Or an Olympic record. <laughs> or an Olympic record. The, the one or an Olympic is, record. I, yeah, or, I, I, but I was yeah, going to say, I, I don't think a world you get... championship win. Yeah, I don't think I you think get... if you say world championship win versus world record, what's more important? I think most of them would still say world record. I don't think I you... think it'd be a 50-50. Yeah, you don't you don't get any direct paycheck for the world record, do you? They don't just cut a check just for putting up a hot time, right? And I you guess don't, but you you're, like you're <laughs> but you're <laughs> only like you're it's... You're only a world now. I'm I'm looking into the future here, right? It's very yeah. rare that we're going to see the world record chipped away at multiple times every season. So my point is, you're only a world champion, and you know, I mean, you're always a world champ. But in in the sense that we watch the world championships, you're only the reigning champion until the next world championships. You could hold a world record for look at Reza, five years, ten years. Mm. Uh, so it, any any pro speed climbers that are watching this please chime in in the comments and let us know oh, what let me let me just also say for the world record though that shit gets forgotten so fast there's a ton of world record holders that even the ifsc's website doesn't have on there right like it i think the ifsc's record keeping just like stops in 2012 that's that wasn't the first like evgeny vitsikovsky didn't break the world record for the first time right so the world records kind of float away into the distance and if the speed route ever changes who's going to give a shit anymore so so i think that's a that's a fair argument right like who's yeah, going to care well, about well, the Go ahead. Once you're no longer, once you're say two generations back in world record holder, so say you're Libor or someone like that, yeah, you you you're not remembered at all. But if you're a world champion, you're always remembered. Yeah, maybe. Once, maybe once not in speed Cup, though. <laughs> once the world record's been taken off you, well, okay. But um, I, like I do understand what John's saying. The other thing that I think pollutes it a bit with speed. And it's because we live in this social media media era is you're always seeing videos of, oh, look, here's someone running four nine in China or, oh, look, here's someone running four. So you, you that actually means that when you're watching, you're going, well, we haven't reached reached for the theoretical maximum because we've actually seen videos of people doing faster off off the record, so to speak. Yeah, but what those people don't know is that they didn't pay somebody to come hold a ruler against the wall to double check that everything was exactly the right size. Oh, uh, yeah, so, the, you know, the, I people mean, just don't honestly, know. People, people don't know how much goes into rule uh, into wall homologation. It's I've been with uh, TDs when they're doing the homologation. It is so incredibly accurate. You know, huge shout out to the guys that get those walls homologated. Because now they almost all seem to be, but I remember even three or four years ago, half the World Cups, if not more, you couldn't get a world record because the walls weren't homologated. Yeah, for sure. No, it's true. I, I can't quite tell if you're being sarcastic about how much work goes into it, but I, I agree oh, no, that it's been... I'm, I'm, I'm not being sarcastic at all. They spend like... So they use the shit of out day. of that little ruler that they have then, yeah? They have, they, the have texture a bunch, and they have a bunch of tools and they've got to do the texture and they've got to do the angle and they've got to do the height of the plate and they've got to do mm -hmm. the height of the plate to the first foot and they've got to do the height of the top hold to the finish pad and they've got to do the shape of the finish pad. There's a ton that goes into it. Fair enough. It's probably half a day at every World Cup to make sure it's homologated. Well, if you can use a meter stick, there's a job for all you kids that didn't get past high school math. If you can add millimeters and centimeters, you'll be okay. Sorry, John, you you guys didn't learn that stuff in school. I know those <laughs> units don't mean anything to you. What's a, what's a meter? <laughs> <laughs> let's uh, let's let's talk about um, let's move on to our uh, female athletes of the year. 
Um, and I, I'm not sure who I want to have start with this because it's kind of similar in that it's uh, we're a little bit split. But uh, who hasn't gone first yet? Eddie, have you gone first yet? I don't think you have. I was. I, I you know what? Let's, I... let's just have you go first on this one. Well, I was actually going to hand Natalie. Have you gone first yet? Yeah, I went. I went for. Oh, Mayo it really doesn't matter. I'm just trying to show you. It's all good. It doesn't doesn't matter. Um. Yeah. Look, first for me on this one was. I think probably the easiest uh, of all the categories because it was Natalia Grossman. Um, I think last year she showed the signs, but there was a, especially when it came to a second discipline, there's far more of a lack of consistency. Uh, she was really one and done when it came to bouldering and then speed, uh, sorry, lead couple of glimmers but nothing solid and this year in boulder she looks superb obviously yanya came out and beat her in maringen but then yanya basically took herself out of consideration by skipping the rest of the season um so there's just not not enough comparison you know she came back and did european champs but again then natalia wasn't there because european champs um whereas Natalia, although she's still superseded by Brooke in lead for the US girls, she really started to become a finals regular, a consistent top lead climber as well, and just backed it up with, I felt, a really strong bouldering season. Um, some would argue not as strong as last year, um, or sorry, as 2021, because we're now in 23, but I think it was her most consistent year in terms of form. Hmm. John and Natalie, you guys want to weigh in on this? Or if you disagree? You go, John. They, I they agree. I chose Natalia Grossman as well. I think going back to my, my rubric there, consistency, five boulder golds in a row. And additionally, she, I think she topped, I'd have to double check this. I think she topped all boulders in the final round in all final rounds of those, those five, uh, gold medals. Um, if not, please, please don't come at me. I'm just kind of going on memory there. <laughs> Asterisk. Uh, I'm not entirely sure. I'm but just making this double up. check that if not, she came darn close. I do know that. And, uh, adversity wise, which was the second metric for me, she had those great battles with Hannah Moyle. Remember in Brixen, she, she just narrowly beat Hannah. And then I think in Innsbruck, uh, something like Natalia came out and she had to flash the, final boulder in order to win or something like that doesn't get any more nail biting than that. That was phenomenal. I, I think then the transcendent aspect of Natalia Grossman's season was how she was able to really shoulder a lot of the, the hopes and expectations of the fans, because I think going into the boulder season, we were all excited because it, it was Yanya without all of the Olympic kind of ancillary distractions and we're like okay this is going to be yanya getting back to what she what what we originally you know were so captivated about which is her on the world cup circuit and after mayringen we think that the coast you know we're, we're in cruise control for that and then and then yanya steps away and i think that there was this desire or this hope in yanya's season that we were going to see her go for that season sweep and we were going to see her attempt to kind of stack some consistent gold medals together and Yanya leaves and those hopes are immediately dashed. And then Natalia slips in there and she starts winning consistently. And so it was like, okay, we can take that, that hope for somebody to like sweep the season. Natalia wasn't going to sweep it, of course, but it's like, a, it's like a mini sweep, right? It's like that same, we could just sort of take the fandom that we had reserved for Yanya and put it on Natalia and root for her to, to win comp after comp and see how far she could go through the boulder season. And it did feel like this really wonderful mini sweep at season's end. And I think, I think in a way, Natalia kind of saved the boulder season a little bit from being maybe somewhat of a bust uh, when, when Yanya left and there was going to be this huge void. And I think Natalia really did a great job of slipping in there and just, Kind of, it was a smooth, it was a smoother transition than it really should have been when Yanya when Yanya left. I think. Quick, quick, quick. Look, sorry, that's the drugs kick, kicking in. <laughs> quick question. 
Um, do you think Yanya did the first World Cup to spoil Natalia's chance of a sweep? Do you think if she hadn't won the first World Cup, she might have done a couple more just to maintain that record? So Tyler and I asked her, uh, Yanya's coaches, coach at the, um, or the national team coach at, was it the Salt Lake City Cup, Tyler? Yeah. We asked if that was the case. Did did Yanya do the Mayringen World Cup just so Natalia couldn't sweep the season? All I can say is, Tyler, it, it was a it was a really coy response. We got kind of a wink, and it's sort of like, well, what does that mean? Like, is it did you or didn't you? I don't know. It's it's up in the air, I, and I don't know if we'll ever know. I like to think that that we have that much you know character in the scene. I'll, I'll be honest, I I. I'm, I think I'm a, a little bit less, uh, um, I think between the two of them, I would probably say it wasn't the case, but I kind of wish, I kind of hope it is. I, I like the idea that there's that kind of, uh, um, defensive nature, a little bit of like throwing elbows, you know, I like that stuff. I think it makes it fun. Um, but it, it definitely happens more in the background than people realize. Yeah, sure. And I think, I think if that was, you know, if that was the, the case, the fact that, you know, she didn't come out and, and say it or, you know, like Yanya hasn't isn't particularly um, uh, uh, um, adversarial with with her other competitors. Right. Like and I think I think if she wants to, she can she can have those opportunities. But for the most part, she, she just, you know, wrecks the shit out of root setters if, if they put up climbs that don't give her the chance to to win in yeah. the way she wants to. So I, I don't know. I think I think there's a chance um, I'm a little I'm a little more uh, uh, bearish on it than I was in the past. Yeah. But oh, they, they all get on fantastic but there is that innate competitiveness and being sure. that ambitious and that good that you want to defend your your position yeah um and that that's not saying that she's got any gripes with natalia or whatever they no. get on great but it's like it's just she she wants to hold that record just like you know in speed they want to hold that record well, let me let me transition right out of this because uh, you know if if Yanya did it as a ploy to to block Natalia from being the greatest for the year, for me it worked. Um, I'm on Team Yanya for Team for uh, 2022 straight up. I can't I can't deny it. And I think um, you know aside from the fact that she won you know every Boulder World Cup that she showed up to giant asterisk in the top of the screen, um, and she was looking absolutely incredible in lead climbing. Of course, it looked like she was going to sweep that season season as well and and it took like you know what could be another once in a generation talent to to push her all the way deep down into a second place based off countbacks what a devastating loss um i think she had another remarkable season and i it's more of a case of you know Walking away from from a season makes it very hard to say you were the best of that season. But across two disciplines, it makes it a lot easier when you start the season fresh and and absolutely kill it in Myringen. You say you're going to take some time off. You come back and you kill it again. Um, and frankly, Yanya has a stellar record against Natalia Grossman, against everybody behind Natalia Grossman. And there's this concept that I think is is what kind of dominates my thinking here, which is, you know, if you lose but people are talking about, you know, the fact that you lost rather than somebody else won. Or if you don't show up to a comp and that's really what people are framing the conversation as when they talk about Natalia's win. I think that says a lot that we're still living in like the Yanya dynasty, even though she did step away for five or six comps and, you know, you can't get credit for comps you don't show up to. I, I agree with that you know, in an isolated basis, but just with the absolute momentum that the Yanya train has and the fact that when she showed up, she continued to demonstrate that she was pretty much unstoppable. Um, I have to say this is just another year in uh, in Yanya's incredible run. So for me, she was the athlete of the year. She dominated the conversation even when she lost, even when she didn't even show up. And so for me, that's, that's my winner, even though I, I can understand the arguments you guys are making. Um, the one I'll say though is like, I don't know, I like I'm, I'm, happy that Hannah Moyle there was to add a little bit of entertainment to make the the boulderings you know a little bit more interesting because I think there's a large step between Yanya and Natalia and then from Natalia to the others it kind of looked like there was another large step frankly 
Um, and I'm happy that Hannah managed to kind of up her level towards the end of the season and actually give us some drama. Because John, you're right. I can't remember if that was Brixen or the final event of the year, but that added some spice. That made it like watchable. That was a really good time having that 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 uh, shootout on the final boulder was uh, was really good. But to wrap it up, Yanya for me is is uh, I can't even I cannot even abide the thought of Natalia Grossman being the female climber of the year this year. So team team Yanya all the way. I'm glad to hear that because you know the 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 North American continent always had a little bit bit of a thing about whether Yanya lived up to the hype, even though the rest of the world, being many years ahead, believed it. But um, yeah, I it's interesting that you bring up Hannah Moyle um, because yeah, she almost rained on Natalia's parade. If she had taken that out, it probably would have taken Natalia out of the conversation for the climb of the year. But part of the winning is more important mentality, the same as when we were talking about speed climbing. That's why I gave it to Natalia because Natalia had to go out and flash that problem and she got the job done. But anyway, I'm taking time. So Natalie. Yeah, I actually picked Hannah because she's kind of the next step, especially in bouldering down from Yanya and Natalia. She had, yeah, I mean, like the year before last, she was making some finals. She was in the Olympic selection thing in Russia, made some finals at the start of the year, but then just seemed to get better and better in bouldering, like two silver medals in the summer in Brixen and Innsbruck, I think it was, like two in a row anyway. And then silver in the European Championships in Munich, home turf in front of home crowd had a lot of interest and media attention especially from German media and just seems yeah just seems really happy-go-lucky like really relaxed in a similar way to Natalia like just it seems like nothing can like nothing can disrupt her mindset she that she's just really positive and happy and smiley and I don't really know how they do it, um, I guess, because at the moment they're both kind of on, they're, they're doing well, they, they're, they've not really got the pressure that Yanya has to maintain medal streaks, but yeah, Hannah Moyle just seems to be getting better and better, and I think for next year, especially if her lead game improves a bit, like she was starting to make finals a bit more consistently last year, if she can combine those two disciplines as well as she was doing last year or even better I think she's yeah I think she's a strong contender for the Olympics and you can tell because like Germany she's a bit of a golden girl in Germany at the moment like all the media all the sports awards like I think she's got sponsors from major finance companies like Allianz and you know all the money like if she's getting that much support from home as well I think that that speaks volumes, I think. Just, she... in, just in time to celebrate, like, you, uh, the 10 year anniversary of you, the Verms, like, world championship in 2024. Yeah. They finally get, like, an heir to that throne after it being yeah. kind of empty for a bit. So, yeah. Yeah, it's interesting because she's another one who, and I know everyone probably thinks I don't even talk about climbing anymore because I keep talking about personality, but she, she, she again has that personality that makes her marketable and she's, huge in Germany uh, you know I seeing her from when she was like a 16 year old turning up in Maringen and making her first semis and I think she had only turned 16 like four or five days earlier and then just watching her ascendancy for youth Olympics and all these things and she always had the potential but when you get these kids come through young you're always like crossing your fingers that they don't derail and they meet that potential and yeah, like probably my favorite part, so not talking quality of athlete or anything, but probably my favorite part of 2022 was watching the the growth of Hannah as a competitor because she's a lovely kid and seeing her just really step into that top echelon, which which needs her. You know, we, we need the, we, we need, that five or six really strong athletes, you know, women's world cups were never better than when it was Anna, Shauna, Akio, Yula, Petra, 
like and you had always this um melissa lanev you had always this really strong group and even though anna and akio took the lion's share like you always went into a final not knowing who would win and it we've been a bit disrupted just with how talented your pick is tyler and how talented our pick is john <laughs> that it's actually kind of like almost made them a bit non-event and hannah sure. came up and said yeah no nah, we got an event now yeah absolutely anybody got any final thoughts or honorable mentions for this one I just want to add something when we're talking about Yanya, because I think it's really interesting when you look at her 2022 season, this kind of leads into, I guess, a 2023 preview a bit, but it just, I come away from the 2022 season having no idea where Yanya is at skill wise, right? Because she, look at the bouldering discipline. Okay. So she was great in Mayringen. But that was it. That was really, I mean, I'm and I'm just talking World Cups here. I'm not talking European Championships and all that. I'm talking international elite level competition. She stepped away after Mayringen, and presumably the rest of the field, Natalia and Hanna first and foremost, improved as as the season went on. So by the end of the season, would Natalia and Hanna, were they better boulders than, than Yanya? I, I don't know. Who knows, right? And then if you think about lead climbing, the lead discipline, as we said previously, by the end of the season, I, Mori was arguably the, or maybe inarguably, the better lead climber. And and then on top of that, you have all of Yanya's stuff that happened with her unfortunate broken toe and everything. So it's like, man, heading into 2023, uh, it's, a, it's a huge question mark for me of where Yanya is at compared to the rest of the field. So Yanya works obviously with uh, Roman Krajak, the coach, very carefully, and they're incredibly tactical in how they approach the sport, um, always have been, but that always creates that mystery you're discussing, John, because you don't know what is going on behind the scenes. You don't know what the the master plan is. It's always, it's interesting because in a sport where most people throw themselves at every comp available, Yanya now is in this position where she can think long term and pick and choose. And, you know, I don't know when we'll see her this season because I haven't looked at the entry list yet for uh, Japan. I don't know if she's on it. But like, if I was her, I probably wouldn't compete till halfway through bouldering season, do a couple, then do worlds, then do a few lead like she doesn't have to do all the comps anymore. Yeah, John, uh, you posted something earlier today, the day that we're recording, Slovenian media saying that she doesn't plan to compete until the Prague uh, World Cup. So she'll be skipping the entire Asian North American swing, um, which given given the injury, uh, I think makes complete sense. Like why, why, why rush it? You know, um, doesn't doesn't stop your upper body training or anything like that for the most part. So she's apparently wearing climbing shoes again. So I might might as well take it slow. Like, what do you have to prove in the first couple comps of this season, right? It's all about the Olympics. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, where's the line, right? Where 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 do you where does skipping comps and or does it ever? Where does skipping World Cups become actually more sort of detrimental in the sense that you're not getting that uh, elite level competition, you're not getting that elite level headspace while these other competitors are. I think you're entirely right. Like Alberto Hines Lopez proved that if you attend an entire freaking season <laughs> of, of World Cups as a warm up, you too can be the best speed climber in yeah, the world. Yeah, and just just think by 2025 rules, he wouldn't have even got to the Olympics. Yeah, devastating. But uh, nor, nor would Colin. But um, it's also, to me, it shows the detrimental effect the Olympics are having on the sport. Um, in that all we used to care about was World Cups and World yeah. Championships. And now they are almost tier two competitions 100%. because your very top elite climbers know that they have more to gain from one good Olympics than 10 World Cups. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah I true. think they'll definitely play second fiddle to the Olympics for, yeah, for I everyone think we- helping. Yeah, Which it, is why I think they have to raise the prize money. You know, I'm, I know it's a different sport, but I'm also involved in disc golf. 
um, which I took up last year to rehab my knee. And it's a smaller sport than climbing. And I can't believe the purses they're getting. You know, they go and do these competitions. They pay down to 40th place. At the end of the season, the top disc golfers are walking away with upwards of $100,000 in prize money. And I'm like, wow, you know, Natalia probably cleared 15. Yeah. You know, that that's not a living. If it wasn't for her sponsors, her team, her endorsement, her knock, she she wouldn't be able to make a living out of the sport with theoretically 20 million global participants. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, you know, we need to rejig World Cups to get them back to being worthy of, uh, you know, Yanya skips a bunch of World Cups because they don't mean anything to her. What if there's 10,000 bucks on the line every time? Sure. Yeah, no, fair enough. Fair enough. And I think I think it just leads into this season perfectly is we're going to see which climbers choose to attend what for different reasons. And of course, we get a world championship, which is always exciting. But, you know, while while I would say the World Cups suffer in the Olympic qualification years, the world championships are probably even better and there is more on the line. Uh, So this will be a banger world championship, I hope. Um, I think we can wrap it there. And I just want to say thank you so much to you guys for taking the time, of course, very early in the morning for Eddie, very late at night for Natalie and John having a like play hooky with whatever you know whatever else he's working on i just also did not show up to work today so that's what we go through to get out this content that we'll see hundreds hundreds of views um again just a shout out thank you john again eddie natalie all of you for uh, for making the time make sure you consume their media of course we'll have links to the work that they do in the description below we're leading into the season join the plastic weekly discord so you can watch comps with us and just chatter about all the behind the scenes gossip and what's happening on the wall play bingo with us if you've never played world cup bingo uh you gotta hop in the discord you can support this channel on patreon of course like us on social media subscribe all that kind of stuff and with that with just a couple weeks to go before we start the 2023 season in hachi thank you so much for watching and we'll see you soon in the next one